Mr. McMahon, the name of a new program that dropped on Netflix. Now, Netflix will never be accused of making a good movie, but they make pretty good TV shows. Where do you think Ozark came from? Where do you think Narcos came from? And I got to tell you, for Vince, who's a very private guy, to give his rights to Netflix, which might be the last project that Vince ever gets made. Very realistically, at his age and with everything that he's going through and in cancel culture, it is very realistic that this will be the last project Vince ever gets made. There's going to be a way, even a great heel, is going to want the portrayal to go. So, Vince comes out yesterday. He puts out a press release. Oh, I should, I should read you guys the press release. Jesse sent me this. I had already seen it, but I know right where to find it because Jesse on Fire sent it to me this morning. I, I had already seen this yesterday, but Vince says, and, and I'm going to go quick for you guys here, but I, I just want you to get the theme. It says, I don't regret participating in this Netflix documentary. All right, now right there, you know there's a butt coming. Right there with that fake Nikeness, you know that the swerve's coming. All right. The producers had an opportunity to tell an objective story about my life and the incredible business which I have built, which was equally filled with entertainment, drama, fun, and a fair amount of controversy and life lessons. Unfortunately, based on the early partial cut that I've seen, this falls short and takes the predictable path of confusing Mr. McMahon, the character, with me, Vince. All right. Now, it goes on from there, but this comes out yesterday. So that does nothing but make anybody want to see this more. Not to mention, how could Netflix possibly, in light of everything that Vince is going through, portray him as anything more than a villain. You, you want to do that. If he was going to come out the face, if he was going to come out the, the right side of this, Netflix, no matter what they paid for the rights to the documentary, would have buried it. It would have never come out. You cannot do a piece on Vince today that takes a nice light. Believe me, it's what I do for a living. You can't do it. The only way you can talk about Vince today is negatively or, or you got to bury it. Now, I'm only sharing that because it was so interesting. The greats will go down with the ship. The greats in the orchestra, the maestro that is leading and conducting, will play as the ship goes down. And I watched Conor McGregor, one of the great heels in our sport, take more flack than anybody I have personally witnessed in our sport. For going after Jolie, talking about the DMs, and doing all of this while falling, quite literally, to Dustin Poirier. And I only offered for the audience, did Connor just reveal himself? Is he the true jerk that you all believe he is? Or is the greatest entertainer in the sport playing until we fade to black and roll the credits, which he agreed and was paid to do. And I only suggest for you, because I don't know, but neither do you. I don't know if Connor, in that moment, came out and revealed himself to be a tasteless jerk, or if he proved, while broken in an ambulance waiting for him, that he is a true entertainer that will play to the final note. I don't know, but neither do you. So Vince comes out yesterday and he acts as though he objects to the portrayal of Netflix, which is now going to give you the only thing that you want. You don't want an innocent Vince. There is no part of the Vince story or saga that is playing out where you want him to be freed. You want to convict the dirty, rotten Wall Street billionaire. Of course you do. And Vince lets you know yesterday in a press release that you're going to get what you want. 
And it was just very interesting. And whether that was a cover, because he's not happy with it, which you would be able to understand on a human level. He doesn't have a lot of shows that are going to be coming out. There are not a lot of more portrayals that they're going to do. Like, like, like Hunter Hearst Helmsley, for all the fame, all the fortune, and even getting to bang the boss's daughter, isn't going to come out and do something nice for the boss. He's going to do the same thing that the boss would have done to him, which he's going to cut his head off in front of everybody as long as it elevates his own status. Like, this isn't something new. It could be 10 minutes from now, or it could be 10 years from now. Vince could be amongst us, or Vince could be long deceased. Like, there's never going to be a day where they're going to come out and go, hey, by the way, this is the guy that made me, and I'm banging his little girl. Like, that, that will never happen. It's one scumbag out for themselves. It's what the business is. And it was so fascinating. You got to understand, this dropped at midnight, and I was looking forward to it. I am what you call a mark, but... I don't tune it on until this morning. I get a text from Jesse, and he's like, dude, skip the first three episodes. Go right to number four. They're going to talk about the Attitude Era, and that's exactly what I do. I go right to episode four, and they're talking about the Attitude Era, which for me is very interesting because that got over. That doesn't mean anything, right? That, that is as useless as an eight-man tag match. That's as useless as a six-man tag match, which they actually used to do. Believe it or not, it's almost as useless as a tag team match, which still exists to this day. <laughs> There's no reason for it. It proves nothing. You can't get over. Nobody cares. But the term attitude era lives on. I don't know how. I mean, I'll just share for you. Like, that's not a thing, right? It's, it's, it's not a thing. How would you describe the attitude era? And there was a time when the Monday night ratings wars were red hot. I was in college, and it was college kids that were moving the needle. Now, I had stopped watching wrestling right around the sixth grade. I remember my buddy Justin and I dressed up as Demolition for Halloween, and that was in the sixth grade, but I don't remember, I don't think after that we ever went to a show or did anything. I'm only sharing, it was that same demographic, it was the same guys, everybody took about a nine or ten year hiatus, and we came back. Now you're college age, and people are back, they're filling up bars for the pay-per-views, they're wearing Austin 316 shirts, they're giving the DX job, I'm just sharing, it was that same group. And they modified it, and they made it more for adults. And we came back. But attitude, that doesn't mean anything. And I've asked other people, like, there are weirdos in this country. They live on the East Coast. And us normal people on the West Coast, we have to, like, put up with them. But they say, and they wear, and they do these really dumb things. So I thought maybe attitude meant something to the people on the East Coast. I talked to some people on the East Coast. It turns out it means nothing there either. I don't quite know how that expression got over. As a matter of fact, I don't think that you could tell me what it is. But you've heard it and it lives on. It was a big piece of this documentary. And you have different people wanting to come out and take the bow for the success. Various people will come out and tell the story in a way that shines specifically them. Well, I, put, I put some socks. I put socks in my, in my dish. People thought I had a big... And I, and I came out. I'm, I'm the first one that, that pulled this girl's shirt off and shared this... And that was really good for the ratings. Like, have you, Captain Obvious here. And while they attempt to shine themselves, and all of these years later, they're still apologizing for it. They're still apologizing and saying, we probably went too far. We probably could have dumbed that down. And it, it, it is a very fascinating thing for me to see. Like, like, meanwhile, I could read a true book on World War II, which was required learning for everybody in the United States of America. Far more gruesome. Or I could just go watch a movie right now that's on Showtime. Or that might get a NC-17 rating. And they're going to use profanity and they're going to kill people, or at least faint it. They're going to do drugs and sell, if not harvest and crop drugs, or at least they're going to faint it. And wrestling did none of those things. And here we are, 20-some years later, with people that make up a weird term like attitude error, which they couldn't possibly explain, still attempt to take credit for it, while admitting out the other side of their mouth that perhaps it went too far so they can really, really just kind of bring everybody in. And... I've never got it. I don't know what they're apologizing for. I don't know what part of being on television where you're not using guns, you're not using knives, you're nobody's dying, even fainting it. 
And 30 years later, people are talking about it under a guise of attitude error. You're trying to take the shine like you did. Instead of just telling the truth, which is WCW just started to become a really bad product. Like it was head to head. It wasn't this attitude error was so great. It, it's what you had on the other channel. It was just better than that. I mean, it's like a Domino's pizza, right? Like we're not declaring that it's good pizza, but it'll be there in 30 minutes and it's nine bucks. It's a very interesting story that nobody can seem to tell accurately. And behind the guise, as I'm watching this whole thing, you have one of the great characters in Mr. McMahon, who is claiming to be just that, a character. And you don't know for sure. And it reminds me of the time that a broken, fallen, defeated Conor McGregor talked about a guy's wife and talked about me DMs. And you decided he was a terrible person. But there was another option. And the other option is he's a great entertainer and you were too dumb to know the difference.